You are listening to the Fly the W670 podcast. It's season number two. It's episode 66, Cubs and Brewers winning streak. Don't forget to listen, download, review, and most importantly, subscribe to the podcast. Follow us on the socials, Fly the W670 on Twitter, Instagram, and of course, Fly the W on Facebook. Also, you can email Crowley and I at flythew670 at gmail.com. All right, Crowley, let's get into it. Uh, We both predicted that the Cubs would win two out of three. We just had a different two out of three games, but let's get into game one that had Jamison Tyone starting in. Yeah, that was the game I went to, you know, and I was excited because it was wrestling night. And so I'm at the game. Get get look at this, Dustin. If this is for the people that are subscribing to the uh <laughs> scores YouTube channel. That's me uh, and my friend William. He's got a Lucha Librador mask and some belts. I was gonna ask you how to say that. Okay, say that again. Lucha Libre. Lucha Libre. Okay. Yeah. Very cool. And so these are some Hulkamaniacs I found there. And they had a wrestling ring set up in Gallagher Way. And so they literally had Lucha Libre. These guys are wrestling. They're flying around. They're jumping out of the ring. They're having a battle royal all there. And then I did get it. I said I would show it to the listeners. Here he is. Ooh, the Hulk Hogan Clark bobblehead. (laughs) This thing is a little ring right there. It, it, It is absolutely glorious. And not only that, you know... Clark how many dressed up how on many the field like cub, that. How many cub related bobbleheads do do you own, Crowley? Oh, Cubs! I got over two hundred and something. I have no. It's it's a. I mean that's that's an off season show. Maybe I'll just get a, like someone to tape it. and We can just go through them because it's <laughs> it is a massive. I mean, I got them all over. 200, two hundred two two hundred plus cub related bobbleheads. Uh, let's see if you can kind of see back there. That whole oh, shelf is entirely filled with it. And there's like more back here behind me. I don't know if you can see some of these guys. And when did when did that start? When did those bobbleheads start getting collected? We're going off track here, but that's okay. Well, it's it live, was about... live podcasting. <laughs> it's, it was, I think it was uh, 2001 was the first. It was a Sammy Sosa uh, with an Eckridge Farm sticker on his helmet. That was number one in 2001. And Very so cool. I, I have every Cubs uh, bobblehead that they've released at Wrigley Field. Every single one. I'm not missing any. Nice. All right. So... Very cool. I love it. You know, All right, so it, let's get at So we're going to blame you then for game number one not going the Cubs' way. Hmm? Well, I will tell you. I said my prayers and took my vitamins like Hulk Hogan used to tell me. <laughs> I just don't know if Jamison Tyone did. Um, that was absolutely crazy. The third pitch of the game, Christian Yelich hits a 416-foot home run to left center. It was weird because in, that, in this game, the ball was flying. If you hit it in this one area, like right in between the old scoreboard and the new scoreboard in left field, and it just hit that and just absolutely went flying. After the homer, Tyone got William Contreras to strike out, but Sal Freelick singled, and then Willie Adamas singled to Dansby, who committed an uncharacteristic throwing error. Yeah. Everyone's safe and moved up 90 feet. Runners on second, third with one out. Rowdy Telesma hit a sack fly to make it two to nothing. And then Mark Cano, who's a recent pickup for the Brewers, hit a two-run homer to left center in the same spot pretty much. And before the Cubs even had a chance to bat, they were down four to nothing. So yeah, very it went really quick. They got down really quick and um, really aggravating, really aggravating from my standpoint, being at home, Crowley, that was a really tough game to swallow. Yeah. You know, and, and, and I'm thinking maybe the Cubs can come back in the bottom of the first Ian hits a solo home run to make it four to one, all three home runs in the same spot. So I'm just thinking this is going to be a higher scoring game in the second inning with two outs. Christian yelled shingled on a ground ball to Nico, but he threw the ball away. Yelich advanced to second William Contreras would make the Cubs pay by hitting a single to make the score five to one Cubs would make it five to two with the Patrick wisdom, a home run. And then Tyone was able to get, you know, the only good thing is Tyone was able to give manager David Ross some length. He went six innings and he gave up five runs, four were earned with six K's and no walks, but the two long balls he gave up in the first were too much to overcome. The Brewers would add one more off uh, in the seventh off drew smiley who gave up a double to William Contreras and Willie Adamas. And so that would make it six to two, and that's the final score. But when you talk about disappointing, Dustin, two runs and four, you know, two home runs and four, you know, in and four runs in the first inning, and then errors by Dansby Swanson and Nico Horner in the same game. Something you don't see very often, if at all. I mean, I I I, I would bet that that has not happened yet this year. It was right? all, yeah, you're just scratching that your both head. guy that both guys had had that. Um right. And the Brewers. You know, all four of the runs the Brewers scored were with two outs. They were three for right. six with runners say, in another, scoring position. A lot of bad, a lot of bad luck in that game. And the other thing is the Brewers played excellent defense in that game. 
right? The no air, they, they just played a tight, crisp game. And that is kind of the blueprint for how to win in the National League Central right now. Right. And, and, and the offense was just bad. You know, they had the two solo home runs, but they only had five hits, Dustin. Two solo home runs and three other singles. They didn't have uh, two runners on base in a single inning. That's not how you win a ball game, Crowley. That is not how to do it. And you know, and the the other thing is, what what is going on? We had um, Tommy Ha to be on today, and we were trying to be positive because of Jordan Wicks, and we're going to talk about what happened in game number two in a couple of minutes. But what is going on with the Cubs pitchers in the first inning? What, what do you think that's about? I mean, it, I, it, it's it's something that it's all you know. I think a lot of pitchers, but like the better the pitcher you are, usually that's going to be your only chance to get them is in the first inning. You know, same thing today in game three. So I think it just sometimes it takes guys a little while to kind of find the rhythm, find the find the place. But you know, the Cubs just seem to kind of it seems to bite them a little bit more. One more thing before we move into game two, and I don't remember if we talked about this on the air or between Mully Haw and I, but I wanted to ask you because I know you were at the game. From my vantage point on my couch back there, um, it looked pretty empty for the first two innings. It looked like there, you know, the seats, at least down low, were not filled. I'm sure you were there on time, as you always are, even early. Uh, was there later on, the, the, the game was packed. I mean, right. it didn't seem like there was a seat to be had. But early on, it seemed like it was a late arriving crowd, and I wonder if that had any kind of an effect. I don't think so. That happens every now and then you'll see it like, you know, some people still kind of straggling to get in and, you know, some people wait until the last minute and then it gets crowded with the lines to get in. They had this. So the bobblehead, you had to get it. like wrestling. So yeah, the bobblehead is at the corner of Gallagher way um, kind of by the brick house tavern. So it's not when you walk in, when you get in a gate, so you have to wait in line. And if you get there too late, you're stuck in line. So there's probably a couple of factors, but I don't think that, you know, really Tyone just hasn't been good enough this year and he needs to improve. All right, game number two, we had a uh, playoff-type uh, pitching matchup between Justin Steele and Corbin Burns. Yeah, this was the one we had circle, ace versus ace, Steele versus Burns. All I can say is, Dustin, Justin Steele answered the bell. Now, the first few innings were very dicey for Steele and the Cubs. In the first, the Brewers had runners at second and third with only one out, but Steele got Willie Adamas to line out to Nico Horner and struck out Andrew Montesario and to end the threat. But Dustin, he threw 29 pitches in that first inning, and I'm thinking, oh my god, he's. Yeah, I he's thought a he was gassed. I thought he was going to be gassed. Then, with one out in the second inning, Victor Caratini, whose name always seems to pop up in these series now, <laughs> hits a hundred mile per hour line drive that hits Steele right above the knee. Dustin, could you imagine how much pain that must? I, I can't even fathom it. Yeah, it. it uh, I was on the radio at that point. Pat and Ron were doing a great job, and then I heard Ross post game talking about that. Luckily, it hit a very fleshy area <laughs> on on Justin Steele, so it didn't hit the bone. It was fleshy. I, I laughed every time Ross said fleshy as I played those clips this morning on the score in the pregame show. I mean, it was unreal. The trainer and Ross, they do come out to look with them, determined good to go. And somehow through that pain, he must have been feeling, because I don't care bone or flesh. I guarantee you, he's got a massive wealth on there. Oh, yeah. Uh, he pitched six innings of shutout ball. He gave up six hits, one walk, and eight Ks. Now, just something I want to keep in the back of Cub fans' mm-hmm. heads. I don't know, you know, his next yep. start, but 111 pitches. He's always have thrown. to keep an eye on that, right? Yep. Anytime you go over 100, you're worried about the next outing. Especially him. He doesn't do it that often. And, and, and he's, you know, thrown more innings than he has forever. So, I mean, just something to kind of circle for his next start. But Corbin Burns was just as good as Steele. The Cubs' only run came in the bottom of the first and one out. Nico was hit by a pitch. Ian Happ doubled. And Cody Bellinger hit an RBI ground out to give the Cubs a one nothing lead. That would be the only run scored in the game. The Cubs were 0 for 7 with runners in scoring position. Burns went seven innings, giving up one run on eight hits with two walks and seven Ks. Dustin, this truly was a playoff type atmosphere from the aces on the mound, the low scoring game, and phenomenal defense by both teams. Both teams, both teams. Glad you're pointing that out. Both teams played phenomenal defense. I talked about that when we talked about game number one. That's the blueprint, and the Cubs played great defense in that one last. They were able to match the Brewers defensively, which they were. They weren't in game one. Um, you know, Heimer Candelario had a great double play to end the inning in the top of the fifth. Ian Hab, Rob Tyrone, Taylor of 
extra bases, making a sensational catch in the Ivy. In the eighth, with Christian Yelich on first and William Contreras at the plate, Jan Gomes guns down Yelich trying to steal second. He, he's, a, he's a great uh, base stealer, Yelich is, and, and that was just so important at that moment. And, and how about the bullpen? You know, lighter pitched one inning and gave up no hits or walks. Yeah. Merriweather was great. Yep. Yes, yes, he was great. He gave a bunt single to Yelich. That's it. And then Elzlai didn't give up a bunt or a hit. Dustin, we finally got what we were looking for. Elzlai had a song come on, Belly Dancer by BYOR and Imamben. All right, I'm going to look that one up, Crowley. They're not <laughs> on my uh, they're not on my playlist. Also, we have to give credit, right, to uh to the catcher, right? And a great uh, a great tag by Nico Horner. So Jan mm-hmm. goes to Nico Horner, nailing Yelich uh, when he was stealing. Big time. Big and time I, play in that game. Big time play. When you looked at the lineup, when you looked at the pitcher on the mound, and you looked at the bullpen usage, that's exactly how Rossi would draw it up in a playoff game. All right. So at that point, the Cubs have ended a nine-game winning streak by the Brewers. We had talked about last week about – you know, the Cubs were in a good position while the Brewers had a bunch of tough opponents and they took care of them. So now it's less than 24 hours. It's Wednesday afternoon. It's game number three. It's Kyle Hendricks. It's Brandon Woodruff. Yeah. If you listen to the last podcast, this is where I was very nervous because one, Kyle Hendricks gives up a couple runs, usually two or three runs in the first couple innings and the Cubs can't hit Brandon Woodruff. And so this is the one that I kind of why I thought the Brewers were going to take two or three. I didn't like game one and I didn't like game three. Game two is the one I felt the Cubs had a chance in. They've been able to hit Burns lately. But, you know, the Cubs got on the board first. Talkman started off with a leadoff walk and then Nico was hit by a pitch with two on and no outs. Ian Happ hit a double to score Talkman. And the Cubs had runners at second and third with no outs. Dansby would hit a, would, would, would hit a sack fly to uh, score uh, and the uh, Nico to give the Cubs a two nothing lead. I mean that was absolutely huge. So uh, Hap scores uh, Talkman on the double, and then Dansby with the sack fly. So the the Cubs are up early. Now the Brewers got a run back when Christian Yelich hit a dribbler, literally Dustin two feet. Hendricks should have pocketed, but he threw it away. So that led to a two base error. Now that then, was a terrible throw, but and I know you you know you and I have different types of schedules. I was in front of the television for almost every pitch of that game. If I wasn't in front of the TV, I had Pat and Ron going. Um, you know, Bellinger didn't have a great game today. It's the first no. time I've been hmm, Bellinger, hmm, Bellinger. Um, not not a great game at all. And I was wondering, should he have had a little bit of a target up? I mean, yeah, it's it possible. wouldn't have mattered, I mean, maybe, but I just wondered. He kind of he got in position to catch a ball, but he gave the pitcher no target. And listen, Hendricks definitely, definitely rushed that throw. There's no question about that. It's just the first time, and we'll get into more of it. But the first time that you kind of question Bellinger, his his best position, his best position is obviously center field. Oh, absolutely. So, I mean, these are these are things that, you know, I'm sure someone's going to pull him aside and talk to him and be like, you know, hey, not even a big thing, but hey, just so you know. But, you know, th- that error, William would come back to haunt him because William Contreras would hit a single to make it two that to guy, one. Huh? Boy, was he aggravating in this series. We warned you about him. He's, he's a really good player. He's, a, you know, he's a guy that can hit. Andy, Andy frames better than his brother does, so... I mean, you guys, everyone knows how Wilson And he's a piss ant. I mean, he kind of likes to stir it up. He's a pot stirrer. Oh, yeah, just like his brother. (laughs) Uh Apple don't fall fall from the tree on that one. But uh, that was all the runs that Kyle would give up. You know, he went six innings and held the Brewers to one uh, one earned run on four hits. Uh, But Hendricks, Dustin, has made quality starts in six of his last nine outings. I mean, that's what you need, you know, you can't, you got to be thrilled that he's on your roster, that he's part of your rotation. He's uh, he's been really good. Do you know exactly, I'm going to ask you this question and I I don't care if it's embarrassing or not. You're going to know the answer. I'm guessing if not, we can edit it out of the podcast, Carl. It's fine. (laughs) Um, So it just makes me laugh. You know, we talk about Kyle Hendricks and he's the, he's the professor, right? And he's, you know, he barely has a pulse and he's just so calm, cool and collective. What is he doing He's got the pitch com on his belt. He looks like Dr. Beeper from like Caddyshack where he's playing with that thing on his belt. Is he sending a signal yes. that tells the catcher? So he's yes. not verbally telling it. He's hitting no. a button. He's hits, he hits a button on pitch com. Yeah. 
So he hit a button on pitch count. Just so everybody knows, I thought that's what he was doing, but I wanted to clarify. So you see him fidgeting with his belt, like he's got like an itch or something at his waistline, and he's actually pushing a button that's communicating from his waistband to the catcher's earplug about what pitch is coming. And to the middle infielders. All right. Very cool. Very, very cool. Yeah. Thank you for confirming what I thought was right, but it just, it just makes me laugh the way he is so stoic out there when he's like tapping on his belt. (laughs) And I'm like, what's he doing? What's he doing right there? It's so funny to me. Makes you wonder too, like, you know, cause I know there's comps and obviously Hendrix is not Greg Maddox, but can you imagine if Greg Maddox had that technology, how crazy that would be? Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. Now, All right, sorry to sidetrack it. No, no, it's good. It's good. Good question. But, you know, we talked about this earlier, is that when you have good pitchers, you got to get to them early before they settle down. And, and again, the Cubs got those two runs early. Again, uncharacteristic for Woodruff to, you know, uh, with that with the walk and the leadoff walk and Nico getting clipped by the pitch, you know, wasn't that – didn't hit him that hard or anything like that. But he settled in, right? He settled in. No runs were scored, Dustin, between the fourth – through the seventh, the Cubs were leading Dustin two to one at the start of the eighth inning, and they only had two hits. I mean, it's crazy, that's unbelievable. Right? That's absolutely, it's absolutely crazy. Really, you know, almost disappointing, right? That they would only have two hits and still, and still be in a position to end up pulling out this ball game. Right. Julian Mother- Merriweather came into the game in the seventh. He faced four batters. He got two of them to strike out. He's looking good. So he leaves the game with one out in the eighth, and David Ross hands the ball to Mark Leiter Jr. He got Leiter got Carlos Santana to pop out for the second out of the inning, but then Sal Frelick singled, stole second, and then Leiter walked the next two batters, William William Adams and Rowdy Telez to load the bases. Manager David Ross had seen enough. He calls on Adbert Alzlai to get the final four outs, but on the 0-1 pitch, one gets away from Alzlai. He hits Mark Canna to tie the game. Um, Alzali would get Toronto to fly out to end the threat, but Dustin, I know I got a text from you right away when that uh, happened. Right away. I got it. I <laughs> sent you a text. My wife sent me a text. She was in the car line waiting to pick up the youngest daughter. Lots of uh, words that we will decide not to say on the podcast were going on. Certainly words that we can't say on the score. Yeah, it was, it, it was, you know, it's really tough in that position because you have no margin for error and you're just coming in the game and trying to get used to your pitches. Alzali has been fantastic. It just stunk that that's, that, that, you know, lighter has been very good too. And it just stunk that that's how it played out, but you know what, instead of the quitting, the Cubs come right back in the bottom right of the back. eighth, right back pinch hitter, Christopher Morrell reached on a fielding air. So they get one, uh, um, they make a mistake and Mike Talkman walks. And then Dustin, I sent you a text because Nico would bunt them <laughs> over to second and third. As soon as he went for the first one, I, you know, that's what's so crazy about this. I thought of you immediately. As soon as he went for the first one, I thought of you. Oh, I'm going, I'm just yelling because I, I, so then look what happens, Dustin. Ian Happ hits a fielder's choice. The runners got moved over to second, third, but Ian Happ, you now have one out. Then Ian Happ hits a fielder's choice. Rowdy Teles throws home. He gets Morrell. And now the Cubs have two outs and runners at the corners. I just think it's a dumb idea. You gave your that now you have two outs. And then this, I'm gonna say, Dustin, and I want you, I want your opinion on this here, okay? Because you know, Wrigley Faithful is on their feet. Right-hander Joel Payam is on the mound, okay? Brewers manager Craig Council elects to pitch to Cody Bellinger. Okay, so it's a righty lefty matchup. Cody Bellinger has, I think, more RBIs than anyone in the month of August. Dansby Swanson, who strikes out all the time, is hitting right behind him. Would you have pitched? To, would you have walked maybe Bellinger to get to, to Dansby? I might have. And earlier in the game, I think they were pitching around Dansby. They did that a couple times in this series. I just don't understand why you would. You know what we we've talked about letting a guy beat you in this situation. If Dansby beats me, then Dansby beats me. You know, tip of the hat. I'm not going to let Bellinger do it. Um, but you know what? It, it, it worked out like council wanted, except for a little fluke. Cody hits one up the middle. The infielder is going to absolutely get this ball and end the inning. But the, as the pitcher lands, his foot lands, the ball bounces off of his heel and ricochets towards third Bellinger beats the throw and the Cubs retake the lead. As Harry Carey used to say, the good Lord wants the Cubs to win. <laughs> 
<laughs> now, we get to the ninth. It's never easy. The leadoff hitter, Andrew Montessario, hits one in between first and second. Bellinger makes the play, but the throw to Albert covering the bags offline, that's an error on Belly. Like you said, rough game. But then Adbert will get Christian Yelich. I'm thinking, oh, my God, this guy's going to hit a home run and yeah. just play the bad guy. But he grounds into a double play. But then you think William Contreras would just let us walk off into the sunset. No, he draws a walk. But Carlos Santana grounds out to end the game. Dustin, that is Cubs Brewers. This is absolutely what you would expect. And I did want to kind of take this quote here a little bit about uh, Nico Horner. He was talking about the game in the ninth inning of the Steel versus Burns game, game two. He was talking about the pitch com in his hat. That's what we were talking about, where you can hear the pitches right. and hit the buttons. He says, the pitch com in my hat goes to 20 on the max volume. That's what Nico said. He said, I hadn't gotten past 18, but I was in 20 in that last inning just to be able to hear the pitch that they were going to throw. <laughs> it was pretty cool. It's just amazing here. This, Dustin, I know game one wasn't great, but boy, game two and three was exciting baseball. If you brought somebody that was never a fan of baseball to a game like that, that that's going to make them a convert. And, yeah. and cheers to the Cub fans who were really cheering this team on in game two and three. I thought the Brewers had the confidence going in. They had the pitchers they wanted going in. And, and you know, I just felt that they were confident, even when they were behind that they would come from behind, and it didn't happen. The Cubs stopped them in their tracks. Yeah, and I'm usually not a uh, big fan of a one nothing game, but that one nothing game, and it was only two hours and 30 minutes. It felt like it was about three hours and 40 minutes, and not in a bad way. I don't mean that in a bad way, but it just seemed you, – you're on the edge of your seat. These are, these are playoff-type games, and the great news is, is that the Cubs are involved and these games matter. Uh, they always matter to guys like you and me, but now they matter to everybody. You know, my mom's weighing in. I'm sure your mom's weighing in. Your wives are weighing in. People at work are weighing in. It's a good time right now, Crowley, to be a Cubs fan. This is the Fly the W670 podcast. It's episode 66 of season number two. Don't forget to listen, download, review, and subscribe to the Fly the W podcast. In this segment, Crawley interviews Rich Biesterfeld of Northside Bound to get a wrap-up on the Arizona Complex League, which ended last week. Joining me now on the Fly the W podcast, our old friend from Northside Bound, Rich Biesterfeld, the photographer extraordinaire and prospect expert. Rich, how you doing, buddy? I'm doing good. How are you doing today, Carly? Oh, you know, Cubs beat the Brewers. I'm, I'm on <laughs> cloud nine right now. And I know probably, you know, not a lot of people are aware of this, but uh, mm -hmm. the Arizona Complex League just wrapped up. And I think, mm -hmm. you know, maybe some people don't understand, but, but you know, Arizona is not just spring training and done. It's home to a lot of things. And the mm -hmm. Arizona Complex League is one of those things. Why don't you tell our listeners about what the Arizona Complex League is. Sure. Um, Arizona Complex League, it's, it's had a number of different names, but it switched to Arizona Complex League uh, about two years ago. Freaked a lot of people out because we abbreviated ACL, and a lot of times you put that in a tweet or something, and people start thinking, oh, shoot, who, <laughs> who's hurt? Who's going to be out for the season? Um, but it really is like the, the rookie league. And a few years ago, Major League Baseball did away with the short season teams. So that's where the rookie ball became even more important because it used to be like guys would come to Arizona, start out there. And then um, I think it was the Eugene Emeralds was the team that it used to be. Guys would go there a lot of times they call it short season. And then before uh, heading up to like uh, at the time it would have been when South Bend was low A, um, you know, before making that step, but they, they did away with that level. So now Arizona Complex League is a lot of times the first the first real step as guys come into the organization. And some of these guys are extremely young, 17, 18 year old kids, basically. Absolutely. Uh, Adon San Sanchez, who was an uh, international free agent, highly regarded catcher. Um, I think he turned like 18 in the beginning of May, but he was he had come up like in February or March. So. And I did notice like his mom and his sister, I believe, were there quite a bit early on in the season. Um, so, but yeah, imagine being that young and being out on your own. Oh, absolutely. And, and, and so how many teams are involved in the Arizona Complex League? 
Oh, great question. I don't remember the exact number, but it's basically anybody who has spring training in Arizona, they have a complex league team. And there are a couple of organizations like the Diamondbacks and the Giants uh, both had two teams, actually. They had enough prospects that they did like Giants did an orange and black team and the D-backs did like a red and a black team. And so these guys, these guys play actual games against mm-hmm. each other, but I'm sure there's a lot of instruction going on as well. Yeah, absolutely. It's it, it's kind of like the minor leagues when, you know, when you look at the minor leagues and, you know, I'll, I'll say like South Bend, for instance, when you see South Bend has a game at seven o'clock tonight, that doesn't mean the guys show up, oh, about six o'clock, you know, before the game. They're going to be there about, you know, one or two in the afternoon because they're going to be doing fielding drills. They're going to be taking batting practice, um, pitchers, uh, pitchers fielding performance drills. They're doing all that work in addition to then they've got the game um, that's occurring. So yeah, they're there a full day. Um, I mean, even, and especially like out here, um, you know, I don't think it's any big secret. Arizona has had a really hot summer, you know, that's, that makes for really long days when you, when you factor in the heat as well as, you know, being there from, you know, like one or so in the afternoon until you know, you're probably going to get out of there nine or 10 at night. Yeah. That, that, it's, it's, it's long days, but you know, the goal is to hopefully get the minor leaguers, you know, the development, the, the learning process, And so as they're there, some people stay longer and some are there just for a short time. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, when you have, you know, the draft, the draft gets done. Let's take uh, Matt Shaw, for example, right? Mm -hmm. He's in the Arizona Complex League. Do you think they know, like when Matt Shaw is there, they know, okay, we're going to send him to, uh, uh, you know, South Bend or wherever, Mm -hmm. wherever he he ends up? Yeah, I think they probably have a plan. But then I think they're probably going to see, you know, okay, how's this guy look in our system? You know, they they bring really all of the uh, draft picks out to Arizona first with the spring training complex because there's a lot of acclimation, forms get filled out, all that kind of stuff, you know, before they actually set foot on the field. Um, but I know I was a little bit surprised before it was even announced that a lot of the guys had signed. Um, I saw like Matt Shaw, uh, Alfonso Rosario, Michael Carrico, um, uh, one uh, – I'm going to forget his name now. Uh, Luis Martinez Gomez. Um, but, you know, five or six of the guys, like two days after after the draft was completed, hadn't officially been signed. They're already in camp and doing stuff. Um, now, yeah, in your article, you mentioned, the, you know, the, the, you know, this is not a team that's about wins and losses. There's a lot of players moving through way more than even, say, even in a regular minor league team. Because, right. you know, even with the minor league, you know, it's like guys move up. You, you don't have that core that's sticking around the entire time. Mm-hmm. You, you have it written down here, 35 position pitchers, uh, players, and 40 pitchers for the season. I mean, that's just a tremendous number. Right. I mean, I, I, the uh, manager this year was uh, Nick Lavulo, who's the son of Diamondbacks Major League Manager, uh, Tori Lavulo. And so, you know, his, his first managing assignment, there's got to be a lot of challenges in there. You know, with that, with, you never know who you're going to have. Um I mean, another big piece is guys that are on injury, uh, coming back from injury rehab. So you get to see a lot of guys, minor league guys. You even get to see some major league guys like uh, Brad Boxberger, um, you know, probably going to get called up or maybe called up later this week. Shane Green uh, popped in for a couple innings. Um, you know, it's it, it's it's fun to see some of those guys, but like Brandon Davis, we got to see him play for a week or two. Uh, Max Bain came out and was, was thrown for a couple weeks just to, you know, in his case, there were certain things they wanted Max to work on. And, you know, he, I kind of alluded to, you know, his situation where, you know, sometimes you're going, oh, man, he could just shut him down with his fastball. Maybe that's not what they wanted to work on, though, because he's already good with that. But throw your change up because we want to see how your change up plays. Um, again, that's that's where that development piece comes in. And while you want to win. At the end of the day, wins and losses aren't the end all be all. Right. And so, you know, for me, we, the, the, it's been the last couple of drafts have been really interesting. Were there any draft picks that you saw? And you see a lot of players come through yeah. that really kind of popped out in, in your mind? Yeah. So for me, I, I was traveling a little bit. I'd gone to Myrtle Beach and South Bend. So I missed some of those big guys. Like I didn't see Matt Shaw or, or Josh Rivera play there in out here in Arizona. I, did get to see him play a little bit in South Bend. Uh, came away very impressed with both of them. But I did get to see a um, couple that, that kind of jumped out at me were Zaire Hope and um, Alfonso Rosario. And um, just both outfielders, 
the the big thing was them, and I think I mentioned it in my article, their speed. Um, Alfonson, I saw him, he almost took like a walking lead, and, and he was almost at second before the pitcher released the ball. Um, then I think like one or two pitches later, he stole third, and, you know, it wasn't even close. So I just, you know, speed, you, you can go into slumps, but speed never slumps. So oh, I really man. like seeing that aspect. Now, one thing in your article that, that kind of just caught my eye is Alexis Hernandez. Now, I, mm -hmm. I saw him in um, – God, I can't even remember. It might have been even spring training this year, sure. I'm thinking. But, you know, Christian Hernandez was that big international free agent signing. And, you know, he's kind of, you know, trying to find his way in Myrtle Beach a little bit. But now, all of a sudden, Alexis is starting to get a little bit more chatter. Yeah, I totally agree. I think – I think there was even, you know, some people I talked to and you kind of wonder sometimes, okay, when they sign like the brother of a player who's, you know, who has more of a, uh, a stronger pedigree, more well-known, you almost sometimes wonder, it's like, okay, are they just trying to, you know, make, make good with the family? But uh, no, Alexis um, really shown this, this summer. Um, it was interesting. I watched him play in extended spring training. So that's kind of that period in between when spring training ends before the rookie league season starts or the ACL starts usually sometime in June. So there's kind of a gap in there. So they have extended spring training where they play games. Alexis didn't look, I mean, he, defense was fine, but offensively he didn't look that impressive. And then it was like, it was almost like flipping a switch when the ACL started, he just started hitting and didn't quit. Huh? Now, you know, you also mentioned uh, some players come back from injury and one of them that, you know, it, it looked like he was going to be out a long time is Kevin Alcantara. And, and, and all of a sudden, you know, it didn't take him long to get back to, into the AACL and later on back to the mm -hmm. minor leagues. Yeah. It, it's interesting with, uh, with injuries. Uh, you know what? I'm yeah. talking about Alexander Canario. Oh, Canario. Yeah. Like my mind. yeah. Oh no. I, well, I, I, but my, I, I think my statement's still true there. It's like minor league injuries are always kind of, you don't get a lot of information. Um, because they don't publish as much. And I know there's, there's HIPAA considerations and all that where, you know, you usually hear a little bit more on the major league guys, but, but yeah, it was, um, it was fun seeing Canario come back. Cause you know, I think most of us have probably seen that video when he got hurt. And that was, that, that was just made, made, made me kind of squeamish, you know, seeing that video. And then to see him come back, uh, I remember in spring training the one day, I was just kind of wandering around and all of a sudden I saw some balls flying out of field six on at, at the complex. And so I'm like, boy, that's hit pretty well. And so I look in and I wasn't sure at first. And then all of a sudden I started connecting the dots and it was uh, Canargo who was taking BP and he was just crushing the ball already. And like I said, I don't think there had been any reports of, of where he was at that point. You found him, Rich, and and and, uh, and and a guy that the Cubs found that I saw in Myrtle Beach, and I'm sure you saw him in your travels as well, was Jefferson Rojas. He didn't spend too long in the Arizona Complex League. <laughs> yeah, he was um, – before the season, I had kind of written the preseason uh, preview, and he was one of the guys that thought, okay, he, he's going to be a guy to watch. Well, I got to watch him one night in, in Arizona. He played opening night, and then the next day they moved him up. But it was the right call because he's played really well for Myrtle really happy for him yeah and, and another name that i think cub fans would be interesting and i always i like you know when, when all of a sudden this guy drafted it you know got drafted what mason mcguire and so <laughs> yes cub fans if you remember the great home run chase of 98 that is the son of one mark mcguire and he was drafted by the cubs as a pitcher mm -hmm. and so you know uh, you know i think that that is just a fun one to watch because of guys like me that you know that home run chase was just so iconic and now to think that you know mark has been around camp to see his you know Absolutely. his kid and stuff i mean it's just could you ever see mark mcguire wearing a cubs jersey if mason makes his cubs debut it would be interesting. Um, I, it's funny that you say that because I have kind of tried to pay attention to it. It's like because I've, I've seen Mark around several times. Um, and, you know, there's there's usually some autograph hounds that are like, you know, hey, Mark, Mark, sign for us. And and he's been very nice and appeasing him. But there's been there's been times, too, where he'll just say it's like, wait till wait till Mason's done. I want to watch my son here, which I totally agree with and totally respect. Um but yeah, I, I, I've usually seen him wearing something nondescript. Yeah, I've not seen him wearing anything baseball related um, to any of those games. 
Nice. Now, um, the, you know, I think that people, like I said, don't really understand all that goes on in Arizona. If we had, say, hypothetically, if someone was going on vacation in Arizona, could you buy tickets and go in and watch these games? Well, you couldn't buy tickets because you don't have to buy tickets. It's free. Um, you know, and a, a probably an average crowd at, uh, at one of those games is probably less than 50 people. Um, a lot of times scouts outnumber the fans or a lot of times the, the fans a lot of times are made up of family and friends of the players. So if you're somebody that's out in Arizona, maybe you're taking a business trip or something, you just check the Arizona Fall League schedule, you contact Sloan Park and, and you know, you maybe see some of these guys before they become big. Yeah, there, there is a site like you can just Google like Arizona Complex League and you can find a schedule on there and it'll show where it is like this year. Um, I think they were, they were doing something with the grass in Sloan Park. So the Cubs weren't playing in the stadium. In fact, I think there were only a couple of teams on the east side of the valley, like the, the Angels and the Oakland A's, I think, were the only teams that were playing in their major league or spring training stadiums. Most of them were like on the backfield. So the Cubs were playing on field one, which is kind of across the street from, from the main stadium at Sloan. Yeah, so if for, for listeners, field one is really where, like, the big league guys practice when spring training happens. Field one, field two, and, mm -hmm. and that's very private usually. But you're saying for this, you know, it, it's, it's more accessible. Yes. And, you know, yeah. and, and as opposed to the backfields where, you know, a lot of those guys will be in springtime. Right, right. Yeah, it's, it's where, as, as you had mentioned, where the major league guys are taking batting practice and, and things like that uh, during, during spring training. So now it's over. It ended last week. I think Milwaukee won it, correct? Milwaukee's affiliate? I believe so. I believe so. I didn't, I didn't make it to the championship game. So I, I, I'm pretty sure that, that's, that, that Milwaukee won it. I wanted to say they played Arizona. And, you know, now these players actually get a little rest, a little bit of a breather. Uh, not so much. Not Some so guys. much? So yeah, they're still um, – so I, I haven't seen the, the official, but you're, you're kind of heading into fall instructs now. So there's some of the guys who are in the ACL. There's some of the guys who are still around. In fact, I'd gotten a, a message from a friend of mine today that um, I think the Cubs were actually playing the Angels on one of the backfields today. So kind of like instructs slash extended ACL um, game. So there's still some stuff going on because there's still guys here who need work. Um, but I think a lot of the like a lot of the guys from the Dominican, the Latin countries, a lot of those guys have gone home to visit family and because they've been here since you know over six months. Um, so I'm not positive who's here, but I know there are still quite a few guys here. Plus, there's a number of guys who are still here on injury rehab. Um, there are even some of the major league guys that uh, I saw about a week ago. Um, I was able to take some team pictures for the ACL team, and they they uh, allowed me to kind of wander around the complex and I got to see a lot of the guys um, that I hadn't seen in a while. Like I saw Brandon Hughes playing catch. I saw Ben Brown, who I know there's been a lot of questions about you know, where's Ben Brown at. So yes, I saw Ben Brown playing catch on, on flat ground, have no idea beyond that, what his status is, how close he is, how far away. Um, well, that's great that you get that opportunity. And then, mm -hmm. you know, next up for you has got to be the Arizona fall league and that's yep. got to be starting shortly. Yeah, I think I think the games will start in October. So that's usually about like six or seven weeks. I, I need to check it. I haven't I've been been so busy with the ACL. I haven't kind of looked ahead. Yet. <laughs> you need a breather as well, Rich. And it, you it's know, nice to have a little downtime, a little little breathing time to catch up. And, and the cool thing, Rich, is that now you are covering uh, the Arizona Complex League, and I'm going to assume the Arizona Fall League for Northside Bound, correct? Yep. Mm -hmm. And so for listeners that are really kind of interested in prospects, and we've had a lot of guys come on here, but Rich, Rich does these write-ups from the Arizona Complex League, and it's going to be the Arizona Fall League. And it's kind of fun to kind of watch how these players develop, where they end up going in the minors, and how their careers develop. Um, Rich, you know, you're working Northside Bound. You're the guy that has the photographs. You're the guy that's in Arizona all the time. But where can people find you on social media? So um, I think I've got it up there underneath my name there. Um, got my That's my Twitter handle, my Instagram handle. Um, you can find me on there. You can, as, as you mentioned, you can find me at Northside Bound. Um, just dropped the other day the recap uh, for the end of the year um, season. And um, I don't have anything regular planned like right now, but I'm sure as, as fall instructs fire up and things, um, 
Plus, I'm going to be doing a little bit of traveling, heading to Iowa next week to catch some Iowa games. So maybe something dropping related to that, too. Who knows? Ah, yeah, our good friend Alex Cohen and those guys out there. Uh, for the That's podcast it. listeners, that Instagram and Twitter handle is at Beast22. That is B-I-E-S-T-22. But Beast is a beast. Uh, Rich, I appreciate everything you do. And, and for being one of those guys that I can lean on when I need some information about players, Rich is a great follow, and Northside Bound has got great stuff out there for anybody looking to delve more into what's going on in the world of pro- Cubs prospects. Sounds Rich, great. looking forward to seeing you uh, in, in Arizona for spring training, buddy. Look forward to it, man. Rest up and get ready because it's going to be another wild one. <laughs> Absolutely. All right, Crowley, great job with that. This is the Fly the W670 podcast, season two, episode 66. Cubs take two of three from the Brewers. They ended the Brewers' winning streak. So with that said, Crowley, let's take a look at the standings. It was The Cubs were able to get one game because they took two out of three. So the Cubs are now three games behind the Brewers. And so that has got to be, you know, like I said, for Cub fans and, and just kind of watching the schedule and all this stuff, um, you know, the three games, the Cubs still, again, like I said, if they keep winning series, they're going to end up, I'm sorry, four games back. They are four games back, and so as long as you keep winning series, you're going to be in this one, and, and, and you still have a chance to win the Central. No, the, well, the Cubs are three games back now, Crowley. Three games back. It's three games problem. back, yep. So as we kind of take a look here, Cincinnati is six games back, Pittsburgh 15, and St. Louis 17. And then when we look at the wild card right here, the Cubs are half a game uh, back of the they're, – they're three and a half games back from Philadelphia. They're half a game up on Arizona, who has been hot, eight and two. And then San Francisco, I, they're playing the Reds. I don't know if we got a final They lost. Yet. They lost. San Francisco lost. Right. So I think right now the Cubs are two up in the wild card on both mm-hmm. the Reds and the Giants. Wow. So we're, we're, we're taking a look and this is, again, we're talking about six teams in here that are kind of all fighting for this wild card spot. Uh, San Diego is definitely falling off at the edge here, but they are. Yeah. So Cincinnati and say uh, the giants are 1.5 back of the Cubs of a playoff spot. So two totals, they're both two games back. And then Miami's three games back and San Diego is falling away from this one pretty quick, but Miami three in their seven in their last 10. Now, very, you know, listen, and they've got a bunch of games coming up, right? They, they've they got 11 games coming up, Reds, Giants, and Diamondbacks. I think there's about 29 or 30 games left in the entire season. Yeah, when, you, when you're looking at the Cubs schedule for September, they couldn't have booked this any better. You're talking Reds, San Fran, Arizona. The only one that doesn't matter is Colorado and Pitt, and then they got Arizona again. Right, Arizona so, twice, and then the final game, the final series is up past north of the Cheddar Curtain up at the Brewers. Right, so this is going to be three a wild games of one. the year. Uh huh. So we did have some news. Jeff Passan broke yeah, the news on this? Tuesday. Yeah. The yeah. Angels put starter Lucas Giolito, relievers Matt Moore and Reynaldo Lopez, and outfielders Hunter Renfro and Randall Grichuk on waivers in a huge salary dump to get under the luxury tax. Guess they're not resigning Shohei Otani. Then Ken Rosenthal <laughs> announces the following player on the waiver, or, sa- or they're saving up to sign him, Crowley, one or the other. Maybe. Yankee outfielder Harrison Bader, Mets starting pitcher Carlos Carrasco, White Sox pitcher Mike Clevenger, and Tigers starting pitcher Jose Cisnero are all on waivers. So, Dustin, teams that claim the players will need to pay their salaries for the rest of the season, that's not a big deal, but claims are awarded in reverse order of winning percentage. So that means that 19 other teams would have to pass on these guys before the Cubs get an opportunity. Now, because of the wild card standings that we talked about, this really actually hurts the Cubs because Miami, Cincinnati, San Francisco, Arizona, all would be able to pick one of these guys up on waivers before the Cubs would have a chance to. And there's some pitchers and relievers there that you wouldn't mind having for a month. Right. You know, the guy that the guy that really intrigues me the most is Ronaldo Lopez, to be honest with you. The other guy that we talked about this morning is that the uh, – Cubs might be interested in Carlos Carrasco because uh, the Cubs uh, general manager uh, has a lot of uh, background with him. Yeah. Carter Hawkins back when he was mm-hmm. with the guardians. So I would right. say I'm with you as far as, as you know, the, out of all those names, Reynaldo Lopez is the one that I would want to get, but 
it's going to be interesting because yeah, all, you know, we'll see, we'll we'll see what up. happens there. All right. So we know Jose Quas went on the bereavement list. That's fine. Anthony K's up. Probably not any big deal there. Uh, but we did find out that Strowman is doing a little bit of activity, still dealing with the uh, uh, injury to his rib cage, the car- rib cartilage. Michael Fulmer, now that's a guy that's been doing really well. His, it seems like he's burnt out a little bit. So I think they're hoping to just give him a little bit of time off, let him get back up and running. But what can you tell us about uh, Nick Birdie, Brad Boxberger? Yeah, just on Fulmer, that was the same injury that Justin Steele had, if you remember that. Okay. And so they believe he's going to be ready September 8th um, when he's eligible to come off the IL. Um, Nick Birdie was diagnosed with right ulnar nerve irritation. So after a second rehab start, he needed to take a break. He was cleared to play light catch today. Boxberger was at Wrigley on Monday to check in with the team. He'll make his next rehab start tonight for the AAA Iowa Cubs. But Dustin, I, I saw this nugget, and, and for those of people in the social media know, uh, Cubs reporter Arizona Phil. He kind of <laughs> – Arizona Phil is a legend in certain circles. He's a sage, so to speak, and he's kind of keeps himself mysterious. People don't know who he is. But he theorized, and he's very accurate on a lot of stuff, that when the Cubs add one pitcher and one position player, it's going to be Brad Boxberger on the first. No shock there. But then I'm thinking to myself, well, is it going to be PCA? Is it going to be Alexander Canario who's having a great time in Iowa? He said P.J. Higgins. Dustin, how frustrated would you be if P.J. Higgins is the guy they call when they expand the rosters? On yeah, it doesn't, that, doesn't, that doesn't make much sense unless there's a rule that I don't know about that they can't. I mean, if, if unfortunately the Cubs were hit with an injury, a catcher, are they not allowed to go back down there? They're not like, okay, after these call-ups, the rosters are frozen. Are they? No, no, no. No, then, then have- why, why in the world? Again, if the Cubs were in a position where they were 10 games up right now, okay? If they were 10 games up and they were on absolute cruise control and you wanted to give Jan Gomes a little breather, okay, then I could understand it. But right now they are not in that situation. I'm happy that they're in a position to be playing in October, but they are not in a cruise control position. Basically every game is a playoff game. So that doesn't make any sense to me whatsoever. Well, we're going to wait and see. So I'm just going to put a little mark on this one here. But as you know, the Cubs got a just a real quick uh, little taste of home here. Now they're back on the road. The Cubs played the Reds. Four big games against the Reds, Crowley. Yeah. You remember they played in the first weekend of April, and one of the games got rained out. That's getting made up this weekend. So you got four games in three days. So we got a day off tomorrow. Everyone gets a day off tomorrow. And then a lot of baseball Friday, Saturday, Sunday. The Cubs were swept by the Reds at the end of May, which started a 12-game winning streak for Cincinnati. But the last time the Cubs faced the Reds was the end of July, early August. Cubs took three of four games at Wrigley. Stroman lost game one of the series, giving up six runs in three innings. That was his last start before going on the IL. Uh, They fought back, but they lost six to five. Then the Cubs and Justin Steele took game two. Remember this one, 20 to nine over Ben Lively. They made that poor kid eat so many runs in that game. Dansby hit two homers, Ballinger, Talkman, Horner, Wisdom, and Amaya all homered. Then the Cubs followed that one up with a 16-6 to win as the Cubs hit five more home runs. And then they took game four, five to three, as Jamison Tyone had a decent start, going up five innings and giving up two runs. But, Dustin, the Reds were very quiet during the trade deadline, especially considering that they're in the playoff race. They sent hard-throwing pitcher prospect Joe Boyle to the Oakland A's for lefty reliever Stan Bowl, but that's it. A lot of them thought they would add starting pitching, and now I'm starting to see articles ever since the Angels put those guys on waiver that the Reds might still try to do that. But they are heading home tonight after playing 13 straight games, 11 of those, Dustin, on the West Coast. They lost two out of three to the Giants. They won today, but on Tuesday night, they were one out away from being no hit by Alex Cobb. Yeah, and how about Alex Cobb? What, 100 and, uh, 133 pitches in that one? That's that it just scares the Jesus out of me. I, you know, I just still have, I have a PTSD from 2003. All right. So let's talk about the starting pitching in this one, Crowley. Okay. Um, they got a double header on Friday. We know that Jordan Wicks is going to throw in one of these two games that, yeah, that we, we know for sure. Right. Do we know game one or game two? I don't think we know that for sure. We don't know Do we? game one or game two. We know that we know one of the Cubs starters and one of the red starters. So the Cubs are going to go with Jordan Wicks in one of the two games. Uh, You know, he made his major league debut and he absolutely was just phenomenal. He has a 1.80 ERA. He went six, five innings, gave up two hits, one earned run and one walk. I think it was a leadoff home run that he gave up. Remember? 
And then all of a sudden he just absolutely, it was absolutely settled down as a leadoff home run to Cabrian Hayes. I want to say. So and who's, so, so who's starting the other game? What do you think? Is this an opener? Is it, um, it, they got the day off. Uh, Jameson Tyone's not going until Sunday, probably. Um, who, who do you think it is? Is it Hayden Wisniewski as an opener? I would, yeah, I, I would go with Wisniewski. That would be who I would see them going with. And, and in that case, do you think you go Wicks game one and see how it goes and then go Wisniewski game two, or are you open with Wisniewski? You know, I, 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 I you know, it's really interesting. I you think don't want to burn to... up your bullpen, right? I mean, we don't know how jo- – we, we hope Jordan Wicks is going to be good in game number two, right? But we right. don't know, and if you're worried, like – if they get to him quick, if you got to empty out the bullpen and then you're going to bring in Wes Niski, he's not exactly stretched out. I think that, you know, in, in a situation like that, there'd be a guy who would have to eat innings, you know, that you'd have a guy, a position pitcher, you know, probably Jan Gomes or someone. Oh, I, 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 I would well, just Tucker say Barnhart's that, gone. Tucker Barnhart's gone. So right. Right. So I just think in all reality, I think I would go with Jordan Wicks first. I think the, there'd be less crowd, you know what I mean? And kind of yep. just have him kind of used to it. Yep. Yeah. All right, so Jordan Wicks game one, Hayden Wisniewski game two is what we're going to suggest. That's, that's a to, uh, guess. That's, a, that's, well, that's a what we're going to guess. suggest. That's what we're going to suggest. <laughs> now the Reds, we know, are going to start Graham Ashcroft in one of the games. We don't know which one. Yeah. Uh, he's 7-8 and eight with a 473 ERA. He um, went 6.2 innings, had a great game, but got a no decision last time out. He gave, went seven hits, gave up two earned runs, one walk. Against the Angels, he won that game, seven innings pitch. Gave up three earned runs on five hits with 10 Ks, Dustin. And then against Cleveland on 815, he got the loss. He went seven innings. He only gave up three runs. So Graham Ashcroft is one of their best starters. So that's yep. going to be one of the better ones they've got. And then uh, it'll be a good matchup. And we don't know who's going game two, so we can just skip that. We'll just call that game one, game two, plural, I guess, right. at this point. So game number three, that'll be Saturday. Javier Assad against a, a lefty named Andrew Abbott. Yeah, we, 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 you know, we, Assad has just been one of those great stories here, three and two with the 296 ERA. Last game against Pittsburgh, he went seven innings, gave up one run on three hits with seven Ks. Before that, against Detroit, uh, he got a no decision, 5.1 innings, gave up only two earned runs on five hits. And against the White Sox, he went, uh, he got the no decision, but went six innings and gave up two earned runs. So he has been very stingy with the ERA as of late. Yes, he has. And uh, what can you tell everybody about Andrew Abbott? Uh, Mr. Andrew Abbott. When you talk about Abbott, you're looking at a guy right there who is 24 years old. He's a lefty. So that makes me a little nervous because the Cubs have not been doing well against lefties. He's eight and four with a 335 ERA. He started 16 games this season Um, against San Francisco. He only went 3.1 innings and he got the loss. He gave up uh, three runs on five hits. He struck out six and walked three. So that pitch count got elevated real quick against the LA Angels. He went four innings, gave up three earned runs five and five hits. And against Cleveland, he went five innings and gave up two runs on six hits. So with Abbott, it's going to be kind of interesting to see uh, what they get there. He was called up from AAA on June 5th. So he's a young guy and he's kind of just making his way through the league. All right. Game four, Jamison Tyone. This guy's got to step up. So, Dustin, you can't sit there and say, oh, we need Jordan Wicks and uh, Justin Steele and, and, and uh, Assad and Hendricks to carry the load. This, this guy has got to be part of this here. Tyone has got to be part of it if the Cubs want to win the division. Um, and, again, that start on, on Monday night when I was there just was not impressive. He's 7-9 and nine with a 562 ERA against Milwaukee. We know he went six innings and gave up four earned runs all in the first inning nine hits. I mean, he had six strikeouts to no walks, so that's good. Against Detroit, he didn't get a decision. 5.2 innings, gave up four earned runs on four hits. That was a grand slam. He had no hitter going into the sixth inning, and then all of a sudden it all fell apart. And then against KC, he got the loss. He went six innings and gave up six hits and only two earned runs. So that was a really good start, but he got saddled with the loss. Yeah. All right, Crowley. Let's talk about... uh the hot and the not, shall we? Uh, Cubs hot and not. We uh, know that uh, Ian Happ has had a nice series coming off uh, the Pittsburgh series. He played well back at home against the Brewers. Yep. When we take a look at hot right now, you're taking a look at Ian Happ. Ian Happ is nine for his last 27, two home runs, seven RBIs. He's not striking out a lot. He's, he's slashing 333, 419, and 704. 
Also just playing phenomenal ball, both, you know, hitting and fielding Nico Horner. Nico, he wow. What a glove. Seven hits in his last 22 at bats. He scored six runs, one RBI, one walk on two Ks, slashing 316, 400, 409, and 809. So Dansby Swanson hits the not list, and he uh, has been struggling at the plate. The strikeouts continue to mount, and he's had a couple of uh, miscues in the field. And what was that today? It was almost like a – I know you're a baseball guy, but do you remember Dennis Savard? It was like the spin rama there at, uh, at shortstop and just barely beat the guy – to the bag. I had to hold my breath again there. <laughs> he, yeah, he's, you know, he, I don't know. He, I know he doesn't like days off, but maybe just maybe he's five for his last 27, zero home runs, two RBIs, nine strikeouts to three walks. He is slashing Dustin 185, 258, 185. So just, just to, like I said, I was shocked when council again, he's had a really good year overall, nothing against the guy, big picture, but now it's, uh, it, it, it is playoff time, so he really needs to uh, step up. Mike Talkman not having great times at the plate, still doing a pretty decent job in the field, but I don't want them to get away from him. I don't. He he gets a day off every now and again. Let let's focus now, Crowley, because we you I won't say we you this podcast has really been giving Cub fans a great idea of who you have to watch out for with the opposition. So who's the hottest guy on the Reds right now? And it might not be the name that you would guess. Right. So, you know, the Reds have kind of been struggling a little bit lately. The, the hitting has not been there, but the one guy that really has been hitting former Cub Crystal Lake native Nick Martini is seven for his last 20 with two home runs and six RBIs slashing 350, 409, 700. So pretty impressive. The other guy that you want to look at is first baseman Christian Encarnacion Strand. He's seven for his last 25 with one home runs, four RBIs but he is prone to the strikeout. He has 11 strikeouts to one walk in his last seven games, but he is slashing 280, 333, and 520. All right, don't worry about the knots for them. Uh, it's most of the team. <laughs> what, what's going on, though, with their prized uh, third baseman? How's he been doing? Uh, if you're talking about Ellie De La Cruz, yes. he was almost on the cold list, I, I, but they have so many guys on the cold list. <laughs> um, but he is cold as well. Four for his last 29 with one RBI. 12 strikeouts to two walks. They got a young team. And so that's the thing is these guys are going to get in ruts. They're going to, we saw it with morale. We've seen it with young guys before with, uh, you know, with God, you know, so many guys, you know, the first baseman that they had up for a while that, that all of a sudden you just start struggling. So uh, Ellie is slashing one third, Matt Mervis as well as on my brain there. Uh, Ellie Dale Cruz is slashing 138, 194, 207. So no home runs, one RBI. So, you know, just do me a favor and don't walk that guy because he is literally lightning in a bottle. He has yeah. two stolen bases. Just don't do that. All Make right. him hit. Prediction time, your favorite four-game series, but this one is uh, Mother Nature part of the reason, and we don't know the starting pitchers in uh, one of the two games on Friday. Um, I'll go first, Crowley. I'll give you some time to think. I think the Cubs can get away with going 2-2. Two and two. I, I think they'll be okay going 2-2 two and two in this in this part of the schedule. You know, Tyon scares me. I don't know what we're going to get from Jordan Wicks in game number two. I don't know who's starting one of the two games on Friday night. Um, I'll take my chances with Javier Assad. I like the fact that you just said basically the entire Reds lineup is cold. Uh, I'm going to be careful. I'm going to say two out of two, wishful thinking three out of four. I'm going to say three out of four just because, right. Dustin, just to, just to mix it up. But I, I'm i trying to wish that into existence. But like you said, there are so many unknowns that two and two is the safe bet. Yeah, but I'm saying the Cubs need to win. A lot of questions. Yeah, a lot of questions this one. All right, that's a wrap, Crowley. Don't forget to listen, download, review, and subscribe to the Fly the W podcast. Follow us on the socials, Fly the W on Facebook. Of course, on Instagram, you can email Crowley and I, fly the w 670 gmail.com. And you can watch us on YouTube by subscribing to the 670 The Score YouTube channel. Crowley, have a great uh, holiday weekend. I'm guessing you're going to be uh, north of the Cheddar Curtain and uh, going around in your boat with your uh, Cubs uh, sleeveless shirt on. And uh, enjoy that. And we'll uh, we'll get back together early next week. No promises right now with the holiday. But uh, Monday, the Cubs are going to welcome the Giants into Wrigley Field. So hopefully they're uh, coming back to Wrigley on a high note. This is this is playoff time, like you've been saying, and, and we need everyone to put that out. So Nico has to turn his volume up to 20. Go <laughs> Cubs! Hey guys, it's Crawley. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this video, please don't forget to give it a thumbs up and subscribe to our channel for more content like this. 
If you want to see more of our videos, be sure to check out our playlist and let us know what you think in the comments below. Also, don't forget to follow us on social media to stay up to date with our latest episodes. Links are in the description. Thanks again for watching, and we'll see you in the next video. Go Cubs!